An arrest in a murder mystery, a case that went cold more than 40 years ago in Solano County. Tonight, the sheriff's office arrested 76-year-old Herman Hobbs. When the bullet-riddled body of a woman was discovered in a cornfield in Dixon, California on August 3, 1980, authorities were left scratching their heads trying to figure out who the victim could be and what had led her to such a brutal end. With not even her identity known, the case seemed to be nearly impossible. But was this a premeditated murder? Or was the victim in the wrong place at the wrong time? Hello, and welcome back to Mysterious Hook. Today, we take a look at a cold case that has endured for 43 years before DNA could finally link the murder to a suspect with criminal records spanning decades. But before we do that, if you haven't already, please subscribe and join our community of true crime enthusiasts. Also, hit the notification bell to get the latest content to your inbox. Now, let's dive straight into another mystery. Twenty miles from Sacramento, Dixon was incorporated into Solano County in 1878. Those that call it home get to enjoy a suburban lifestyle without the rush of big city living. It is a farming community known for its alfalfa fields, dairy farms, and sheep farms. Dixon also plays host to the annual Lamb Town Festival and the Mayfair, the oldest state fair in California. In 1980, Dixon became the focus of a crime that shocked the small farming community when the body of a young woman was found in a cornfield. On August 3, 1980, at around 3 p.m., in the height of summer in the United States, two cornfield workers were busy clearing a field near Seavers Road in Dixon. As they made their way through the stalks of corn, on the ground they noticed something unusual. Approaching with abject caution, the men cleared a path and discovered the body of a young woman. Without hesitation, they called their manager, who contacted the police immediately. Within moments, officers from the Solano County Sheriff's Office arrived and cordoned off the scene. It was ruled a homicide, as the victim appeared to have been shot multiple times. They searched the immediate area for clues, but found nothing. There was nothing belonging to the victim in the area, nor any form of identity. After questioning other workers and potential witnesses, they received no answers to their growing questions. Investigators surmised that the young woman was killed elsewhere and dumped in the cornfield as it was close to the road. The victim's body was taken to the county mortuary for a full autopsy. The cause of death was ruled as homicide by gunshot wounds. She had been shot six times in the head and neck. There were no signs of a sexual assault or defensive wounds. Using the victim's fingerprints, investigators tried to search various databases to find any record that would help identify her. A search of missing person databases didn't provide any leads, nor did the victim have any criminal records. She was named as the Dixon Jane Doe, and a profile was developed with pictures and a composite. In the report, she was described as being white with brown eyes and dark brown hair cut into a punk rock style. She also had a small dark mole on the left side of her chin. The coroner estimated her age to be between 15 and 23. Her height was measured at 5 feet and 2 inches and her weight at 155 pounds. At the time of her death, she was wearing a green wool sweater and a light blue long-sleeved smock with wooden buttons, a small floral design, and a safety pin that was used to secure the top together. On her left finger was a white metal spoon ring, and she was also wearing a wooden bead necklace. Despite the information being made available to all local police departments and sheriff's offices, the victim's case grew cold quickly. The leads dried up and tips were few and far between. Investigators kept checking back with the victim's fingerprints, but nothing was found on any systems. The victim's remains were buried in a Solano County cemetery a month after the body was discovered and marked as a Dixon Jane Doe. The case grew cold. Periodically, investigators would look through the file. 
It was ten years later they received a new lead. On June 19, 1992, the Solano County Sheriff's Office received new information regarding the Dixon Jane Doe case. The National Missing Persons Unit contacted the investigation team regarding a missing persons report made by Augustine and Sally Campilia on May 12, 1992. They reported that their daughter, 21-year-old Holly Ann Campilia, went missing in July 1980. According to the Campilia family, they had reported Holly Ann missing in July 1980 after receiving a letter from her that stated she did not want to have any more contact with them. They tried to trace the address on the letter but discovered that it was from a fake street address. Holly Ann's parents then discovered that the missing persons report that they filed initially in July 1980 was somehow deleted from the national database two weeks after it was made. Having received the new information, investigators ran the details received through the database. They also requested DNA samples to test against that of their Jane Doe. Five weeks later, the Campilia family received the devastating news that Holly Ann was, in fact, the Dixon Jane Doe. Holly Ann Campilia was born in 1959 to parents Augustine and Sally Campilia. She was the eldest of five daughters and raised in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. She was a free spirit, according to her family, and always cheerful. She adored her sisters and often sewed their dresses and helped with styling their hair. Her father, Augustine, said she was a talented and artistic person. Life had seemed to be on track for Holly Ann, as she was performing well in school, scoring straight A's. However, it was in her senior year in 1976 that Holly Ann began to change. Her parents noticed her withdrawing from the family and then discovered she had started abusing substances. They also noticed the change in her mental health and her emotional breakdowns. What they couldn't understand was the root cause of her problems. Despite her personal problems, Holly Ann went on to enroll at the Glassboro State College studying toward a degree in fine arts. It was then that she started to behave erratically again. Holly Ann began running away from home. The first incident occurred in 1977. She disappeared for over a month before her parents found her walking along Route 70 about a mile from their home. Over the next few years, Holly Ann continued her pattern of running away from home and becoming less responsive to the medical treatment she was receiving for her emotional problems. Her mother Sally said that Holly Ann needed to be watched at all times or she absconded from home constantly. Holly Ann's family tried desperately to make sure they gave her all the help possible. The last time she saw her daughter alive was June 10, 1980, while they were on their way to a counseling center. Holly Ann began to grow agitated, and while her mother drove, she started to have an outburst, insisting she needed to do things her way and see the world. Holly Ann tried opening the door as her mother drove. Sally pulled the car over to the side of the road to reason with Holly Ann, who immediately walked away. Despite trying to pull her back, Sally could not hold on to her daughter. Sally immediately returned home and called the Cherry Hill Police to report Holly Ann missing. They provided assistance by stopping several girls who looked like Holly Ann, but it was too late. She had already made her way out of town. A month later, they received a letter from Holly Ann addressed from Sacramento. According to the letter, Holly Ann said she was living with two guys and told her parents not to think of her anymore. A trace of the address led them nowhere. It was then they reported her missing and had her name and profile uploaded to the missing persons database. Little did they know, her details were accidentally erased from the system. The Campilia family turned to other missing persons networks and Social Security to see if Holly Ann had somehow turned up somewhere on their radars. For years, her family waited for answers. I just kept hoping she would show up one day with grandchildren, but with each year, I'd lose a little hope, said Sally. After 12 years of holding out hope, the Campilia family had finally found Holly Ann and in a way received the closure they needed. My daughter said to me, Mom, Holly gave us 12 years to get used to this, said Sally. 
With each year, we lost a little hope. In a way, knowing what happened to her is some kind of relief, she said. Holly Ann's remains were flown back to New Jersey from California for her final burial in 1992. Sally remarked that it would be the first and last time Holly Ann would be on a plane. She could never wait for a plane. She either hitchhiked or took a bus. When they send her body home, it will be the first time she was ever on a plane. And the last. Investigators now had a name for the victim and worked with Holly Ann's family to find answers to her murder. Having not heard from her in over 12 years, they could offer no new information that would help the case. They were back to square one. No new leads meant no moving forward with the investigation. The case went cold again. As the case sat cold, the family began looking at the new technology that was being introduced to solve cold cases. In 2021, Holly Ann's sisters approached the Solano County Sheriff's Office to find out if it was possible to retest all the biological evidence that was collected from the crime scene and Holly Ann's body. The Sheriff's Office reviewed the case and resubmitted the evidence. Fortunately, the evidence was preserved properly. Advancements in technology allowed for the biological material to be tested despite how old the samples were. The DNA samples were sent to the Serological Research Institute, who were able to discover a foreign DNA profile. The lab results confirmed that the foreign DNA found on several pieces of evidence was that of a male. With a new DNA profile, officials submitted their new findings to the San Mateo Crime Lab in California. They soon discovered that the DNA profile was already on their system and belonged to a man already doing serious time in prison, Herman Lee Hobbs. 76-year-old Herman Lee Hobbs was already serving time at the Valley State Prison in Chowchilla. Hobbs had lived in Sacramento and worked as a mechanic. Reports suggest that he was married to a woman named Louise Hobbs and had children with her. Hobbs was alleged to have been a drug user and also involved in manufacturing methamphetamine for his own use. There is not much information regarding his personal life, but Hobbs's criminal history is extensive and disturbing. In 1969, at age 22, Hobbs was apprehended after leading police on a wild car chase following a spate of robberies in Sacramento. He admitted to being responsible for more than a dozen robberies and agreed to plead guilty to being the serial burglar. However, during his sentencing, he attempted to escape from the courtroom and had to be tackled and subdued by courthouse officers. He was released in 1975 after serving just five years, but the worst was still to come. In the year 2000, Hobbs's criminal career came to a crashing end. He was convicted of assaulting a female from Yuba County, California. Following his conviction, his own daughter and niece came forward with a tip that Hobbs may be responsible for numerous fatal attacks between 1975 and 2000. Investigators looked back at several cold cases and were able to identify Hobbs's movement since his release. In January 1975, 13-year-old Terry Pata had left school early after complaining of feeling sick with a headache. She never made it home. Her body was found nine days later, stuffed in a drain pipe along the route she normally took home. She had been fatally wounded with a knife. Investigators discovered that Hobbs had moved to Rio Linda in 1975 and lived only a block away from Terry's home. With Hobbs' DNA already on file, they tested it against the evidence from Terry's murder and found a positive match. Hobbs was already serving a lengthy sentence for the Yuba County case from 2000. He pleaded no contest to Terry's murder and was given another sentence of 25 years to life. Another cold case resurfaced following Hobbs' arrest. In the year 2000, loggers working near the Yuba County foothills discovered the skull of a woman. The remains were sent off to an anthropology lab in California for DNA testing. The results proved that the skull belonged to 29-year-old Brenda Ann Tucker, who was reported missing in May 1994. Her clothes were found neatly folded by a creek in the Rackerby area, and her car was discovered in a parking lot of a Brownsville market. 
Brenda was classified as missing until December 2000. After the results from the autopsy, it was proved that it was a gunshot to the back of her head that killed her. Furthermore, witnesses came forward after the discovery claiming that Brenda was murdered. The case went to trial while Hobbs was serving his sentence for Terry's murder. Yuba County Detective Sergeant Phil Spadini testified at the trial. In court, he said that witnesses claimed to have seen Brenda leave Hobbs' residence shortly before he too was seen leaving. He also said the clothing belonging to Brenda was found about a half a mile from the home he shared with his wife Louise in 1994 and included a towel from Hobbs' own home. He further added that Brenda's remains were found a short distance from where Hobbs lived in 1984. Spadini also brought forth two calls received from women in Yuba County that alleged Hobbs assaulted them, one of which said her assault occurred near the woods where Brenda's remains were found. Brenda's family said that Hobbs knew them well and was often a house guest during the 1990s. DNA found on the black pants that Brenda was last seen wearing proved to be a match to Hobbs. But on September 17, 2002, during his arraignment, a judge dismissed the case, stating that there was insufficient evidence to link Hobbs to Brenda's murder. Investigators were also looking into a possible link between Herman Lee Hobbs and the disappearance of 35-year-old Jennifer Lynn Wallace from Dobbins in Yuba County. Jennifer was reported missing by her estranged husband in November 1997 after failing to meet him as scheduled. In 2023, Hobbs's name resurfaced after DNA found at the Holly Ann Campilia crime scene matched his own during the reinvestigation of the case. A warrant was issued to obtain Hobbs's DNA in order to confirm a direct match. It proved to be a positive match to the male DNA profile found on the evidence. Hobbs was charged and arrested on February 24, 2023 for the murder of Holly Ann Campilia. He was transferred from the state prison to Solano County Jail. He is being held without bail and on a state prisoner hold. Hobbs is set to be arraigned on March 13, 2023 in the Solano County Superior Court in Fairfield. Investigators are currently working on investigating five other cases that may be linked to Herman Lee Hobbs. Following the confirmation of Hobbs' involvement in the death of Holly Ann Campilia, the Sheriff's Department released a statement thanking the Campilia family and the investigators working the case. We are grateful to the Campilia family for their patience and assistance, to the labs whose new technology allowed additional testing of older evidence, and to the staff who worked tirelessly to help bring closure to a lifetime of waiting, they said in a statement. Sadly, Holly Ann's sister Karen died aged 47 on June 11, 2009 from natural causes. On July 3, 2016, her mother Sally Campilia also died at age 83 without knowing who was responsible for her daughter's murder. The Solano County Sheriff's Office said that detectives are still working with other agencies in Northern California to identify and possibly link Hobbs to other cold cases and possible victims. For investigators who take on the challenge of cold cases, it becomes a job motivated by determination, dedication, and a responsibility to the families of the victims to see a case through to the end, no matter how many years it takes to find answers. In the case of Holly Ann Campilia, her family's need for answers may be able to bring closure to many other families who may have lost loved ones to the evil motives of Herman Lee Hobbs. What are your thoughts on today's case? Do you think Herman Lee Hobbs could be responsible for more cold cases in the Yuba County area? Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below, and remember to stay safe always. Do not forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel for more gripping stories like this.